Hello, good to be back with you today. And uh, it's good to be looking at a different subject today that we don't really know as much about as we would like to know. Uh, but we do know some things, and so we're going to talk about that today. And hopefully it will be helpful. We're, we're talking about demons and what they are and, and how they work. Um, of course, in the picture here, that's just a black cat, which really has nothing at all to do with demons. But that's sort of the picture that a lot of people have in their head when they think of uh, demons or demonic things, these things with evil eyes like cats seem to have, if we somehow that's become a, uh, a picture that a lot of us have in our minds of that. But it, that's just really uh, not related at all to the demons of the Bible, it's, but it's just sort of that imagery that we have. But here's the very first question I, I put in the comments, and I'm going to start with this one right away, but nobody has answered it still. So uh, go ahead and answer this one if you have an answer. Uh, and that is, what are demons? Um, there's probably a number of ways you could answer this. Um, I'm not really looking for the origin of demons. Where did they come from? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. There are people who believe they know the answer to that and are very convinced and write books about it. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll give you their arguments for why. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say they're the descendants of the giants that we read about in Genesis 6, the sons of God that intermarried with, with uh, the daughters of men and, and their offspring. So these were angels that came down and, and uh, had children with, <clears throat> with women and their, their descendants uh, were the giants. And then when they died, their spirits became demons. Well, apparently that's an old Jewish fable, but that is not in the Bible at all. That is not a, uh, a biblical point of view. We don't have anything in the Bible, which is the only thing that can really tell us uh, what, where, what is the origin of demons. Uh, the prop, most popular idea is that they were angels who sinned against God. We do know that there were angels that sinned against God and, and were cast out of heaven and bound. Uh, and it's possible that that's what demons are. Um, but again, we don't know. We're not told. Uh, but Ronica gives us really the, I guess, best definition that we have of them. They're evil spirits. So they are spirits. They're evil, or they are also called unclean uh, spirits. But... Uh, that's what, what we want to start off with, is just what are demons according to the scriptures? And they are spirits, which this is not the idea of, of just... Um, some people think of spirits as just sort of different emotions or thought processes or something like that. Uh, I have a spirit of depression, you know, uh, something like that. No, these are people, not humans, but they're, they're persons, they're spirits, like we are spirits. They can think for themselves, they can speak, they can fear, they can control the body of those that they possess. And um, when I say that they control the body, we're, that's as opposed to controlling the mind. But uh, that doesn't mean that the body has no influence on the mind. It certainly does. Uh, but but they, they're just like our spirit controls our body. If, they, if that spirit comes into our body, they control our body, or at least parts of our body, uh, as we will see. And so uh, there is this, this idea of they are persons. They are spirits with their own minds. That's what a demon is. Uh, in Mark 1, verse 32 through 34, it says, At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. 
and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So here's the idea that they could speak and they could know things. They were thinking beings. Uh, these demons were are not just some sort of influence. These were are beings who spirits who can think, who can speak, uh, who can know things. In Luke 4, verse 33 through 35, it says, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. So here, this uh, spirit of an unclean demon is is in this man, and and he cries out. He's using the man's body, the man's voice, but it's clearly the demon doing the speaking. And uh, he he's he says, "I know who you are." Uh, but Jesus doesn't like it when the demons tell people who he is. That's not the testimony Jesus was looking for. So he didn't really allow them to, to speak and tell people uh, who he was. That's not how he wanted people to know who he was. In James 2, verses 19 and 20, it says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And so he says, okay, if you believe in one God, that's great. You should. But even the demons believe this. Demons are able to believe and fear. They're trembling because of their faith. But that doesn't help them uh, because they did not obey the one God. All right, so the second question here is, is there any indication that demons control anyone's thoughts? Um, so this is the idea that a lot of people have of demons that uh, if they think evil thoughts, it's a demon controlling their thoughts. Um, is there anything in the Bible that would indicate that demons control anyone's thoughts? So the next question we're going to have is whether there's any indication that they influence anyone's thoughts. But, but this question is, do they control anyone's thoughts. Is there any indication of that in the Bible? And if there is, uh, please give us the, the passage because that will be helpful to us in this discussion. Um, there, there is perhaps um, a, a sense in which they they take someone out of their right mind. Uh, in the case of Legion, when those many demons were in the man, it says later on, after the demons were cast out, that he was sitting and in his right mind. Um, so there's an indication he wasn't in his right mind when the demons were in his body. Um, but uh, I think that's almost the same as, you know, you can... You can give drugs to somebody and have uh, a big effect on their thoughts. You know, when you put something into their body that's not supposed to be there, it affects the mind. It affects their thinking. You can even cause them to hallucinate things, but you cannot control what they hallucinate. So you can influence their thoughts, but you can't control their thoughts. Um, and I, I don't know of any indication that demons ever controlled anybody's thoughts. 
So that's uh, if you if you know of any, go ahead and and uh, give us some uh, of that information in the comments. But I want to take a moment to go back to the Old Testament and see demons in the Old Testament. Uh, there is no nothing that I know of about uh, demons working in the same way in the Old Testament as we read about in the New Testament. But they're certainly mentioned there in the realm of false gods. They're demons or unclean spirits. In Leviticus 17, verse 7, it says, They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. So he says they were sacrificing to demons. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, it says they sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. He's talking about the idols, I believe, uh, but but uh, he, he's talking about an idea of false gods that are demons. In Second Chronicles 11, verse 15, he says, Then he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols, which he had made. So uh, they were worshiping demons when they were worshiping idols and false gods. Even if there wasn't an idol for it, it these false gods were considered to be demons, uh, evil spirits, unclean spirits that they were worshiping, not the holy spirit the, the who is God. In Psalm 106, in verse 37 through 38, it says they even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So here he, he says the idols of Canaan were demons, and, uh, and they were sacrificing to them and worshiping them. So when they worshiped these idols, they were worshiping demons. Well, this is confirmed in the New Testament as well. In 1 Corinthians 10 verses 19 through 21, he says, what am I saying? Is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. So here he's he's talking about not eating food that is sacrificed to idols. And he, he says, well, I'm not saying that the idol is really anything. It's It's a statue. But really what the Gentiles are worshiping, what they're sacrificing to are demons. They're not sacrificing to God. And so if you're participating in this, if you are uh, actually uh, eating this, this food and participating, you are participating in fellowship with demons. That's what you're doing uh, because they're following demons in this sacrifice. They're not following God. All right, we do have... Uh, a verse Ronica has given us. Let's take a look at, at this one before we get into the next question here. Uh, Luke 8, verse 27 through 36. I don't have it all here. Let's see. So this is the, okay, this is the story of uh, the, of Legion. This is the one that, that I mentioned before. We'll, we'll come back to this later um, as we we go through the lesson, but uh, thank you for the reference there. That's the, the one that I was talking about, the one who was not in his right mind. Uh, so question number three then is, is there any way that demons influence our thoughts? Now, we've talked about here this uh, perhaps controlling the body affects our thoughts in some way. Uh, and this man who had the legion in him wasn't considered in his right mind. But here I want to, I'm really asking about influencing us to think 
sinful thoughts, influencing us to uh, to think that we should do something that is wrong. Is there any way that demons influence our thoughts on those things? And if so, how? If we know. Um, do you have any any scriptures that would apply to this? Is there any uh, anything you remember that would be said about this idea? All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go on, and uh, you can go ahead and post your answer if you have one. But demons teach lies. That's their their main way of leading people into error. Uh, you don't even have to have idolatry involved, like we talked about them worshiping these demons. Uh, I believe it's very much a similar idea, but even without idolatry, you can still be following the teaching of demons. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So he, he says there are certain teachings that are from demons. They're, they're the, the doctrines of demons. And if you want to ask me how the demons teach this, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, of course, there are people who claim that they hear a voice, that, that God is speaking to them, telling them to do things clearly God would not tell them to do. Is that the voice of demons speaking to them directly? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but somehow the ideas of of sin, the, the lies of Satan, as he deceived Eve, they are in the world, and, and these are the doctrines of demons. And so uh, he, he describes it in this way. They're giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So I don't know how much direct communication demons do. I'm not aware of any, but, uh, but certainly they're somehow involved in lies that lead people away from the truth. In James chapter 3, in verses 14 through 18, he says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom did not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, yielding, uh, sorry, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so he says there's a very clear distinction between the wisdom of God and the wisdom that is demonic, which is what most people follow. Most people follow the demonic wisdom because it's earthly, it's sensual, it appeals to our our earthly side. It appeals to our flesh. And uh, and so that is, he says, demonic. It, it's according to the lies of Satan. It's according to the lies that are spread by his household, those who are demons. We don't know how, but it, he's not talking about demons taking over your mind and making you think these thoughts, he's he's saying you have a choice. You can you can follow the wisdom that is demonic, or you can follow the wisdom that is from above, and and that is something we have a choice in. It's not something that they are controlling in us. All right, now is there any record of demon possession before the time of Jesus? 
And when I say any record of demon possession, I don't mean are there any stories of uh, of this idea. You know, there's, I suppose there's probably stories about gods of some sort inhabiting somebody's body and that sort of thing, but those are just stories. Is there any historical record? We have historical record in the New Testament. Uh, even Josephus, the the uh, historian who was around the time of Jesus, uh, during the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and all of that, he claims that he saw someone uh, casting out a demon, although it was probably a fake uh, because he he talks about you know, he used these incantations Solomon left and all this sort of thing uh, that we don't read about in the Bible at all. Um, but you know we read about demons in the Old Testament, but we don't read about demon possession um, unless you can think of an, an example anywhere. I'm not aware of any record of demon possession before the time of Jesus. Suddenly, in the time of Jesus, there's a lot of it, it seems. Uh, there's a lot of people coming to, to have uh, demons, or bring people bringing people to him to have demons cast out of them. And, uh, and this was new in the time of Jesus. We don't read about that in the Old Testament. Um, and people, some people would say, well, it was there. They it just wasn't recorded. But I don't, I don't see that being a good argument. And I think there's other reasons to believe that this was new at the time of Jesus as well. So here's the next question, and uh, hopefully somebody can answer this one. I think even. Even denominational people who don't know much about the Bible could probably answer this one accurately, I think, uh, or close to it. Close to accurately, maybe, is a better uh, way to put it. But <laughs> what is the main thing necessary to cast out demons? Even if you look, if you're familiar with how people cast supposedly cast out demons today. You might see this always being used. Uh, and Brittany says, in the name of Jesus or with his authority. And that's it. That's exactly it. Uh, of course, most people would probably just say the name of Jesus. Uh, but it has to be more than just that. It, you actually, you can't just say the name of Jesus. You actually have to have his authority. That was the main thing necessary to cast out demons. All right, so we're, we'll see that as we go through this next section. But uh, casting out of demons was a sign of the kingdom of God, uh, which is one reason why I don't think there was, there were any cases of demon possession, were at least not casting out of demons, before the time of Jesus, because we'll see as we go through these that it was a sign of the kingdom of God. In Matthew 8, verse 16 through 18, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. So he says he's fulfilling prophecy here. Now, uh, he's not only casting out demons, uh, he's, he's also healing the sick. And that's all the, the prophecy actually deals with. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. But you'll see that demon possession is grouped with sickness uh, very often in in the New Testament when it when it talks about this idea that that they go together because demon possession was another uh, it was essentially another type of being sick um, it wasn't just being sick it was a spirit 
inhabiting their body, causing their problems. Uh, but it was associated. It was, it was in a way it was like being sick. It was just a different cause than a physical cause. Uh, in Matthew 10 verse one, he sa it says, and when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them the power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So again, you see that association here, but also you see he gave them power over the unclean spirits. If he didn't give it to them, they wouldn't have it. They, not just anybody could cast out the unclean spirits. In Luke 9, uh, verse 49 through 50, John got upset about something. He told Jesus, now, uh, now uh, John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him for he who is not against us is on our side. So he says he was casting out demons, but how was he doing it? He was doing it in the name of Jesus. And Jesus recognized, he understood that this person can't do that. He can't cast out demons in his name if he's not really on his side, if he's not actually following Jesus. John didn't think he was following with them because he didn't know him, but Jesus apparently knew him. He had I don't think anybody could do this if Jesus didn't give them the authority. You can't just claim the authority of Christ if you don't have it. And we'll see that in another example here in a moment. In Luke 10, verse 17, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Uh, and so... <clears throat> They, they were happy that they could cast out demons, but they recognized it was because of Jesus' authority that the demons were subject to them. In Matthew 12, uh, verse 22 through 29, it says, there, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? So they recognized this casting out of the demon as a sign of the Messiah, the son of David, the Christ. Verse 24, now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." But if I cast out demons by the spirits of God, by, sorry, by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? So here he's, he's talking about... Uh, this accusation, he's answering this accusation that he's possessed by Beelzebub. That's how they put it in another passage, that he's actually possessed by the ruler of the demons. And that's how he can cast out the demons. Uh, but Jesus says that doesn't make any sense because why would the ruler of the house uh, be against his own house, casting out his own people, his own servants? Uh, if Satan is it casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. And so he says, first of all, he says, if I do it by Beelzebub, then how do your sons do it? <laughs> Only one person can be possessed by Beelzebub at a time, right? But there's other people casting out demons too. He's not the only one. Uh, and then he says, in verse 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, 
Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus says this is a sign of the kingdom of God. Casting out demons was a sign. And so uh, this was this is not just something that is done in general. This is a sign of the kingdom of God because it, it shows that Satan's power has been bound. The strong man has been bound and that he, Jesus is able to plunder his house, cast out uh, his, his uh, people, his spirits from these people that are oppressed by them. In Acts 19, we have this example of these ones that tried to use the name of Jesus <clears throat> to cast out demons, but they didn't have his authority. In verse 11, it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Apparently, they didn't even have to say anything. They just brought the handkerchief, and poof, the, the evil spirit left. Because it wasn't about the wording, it was about the authority of Christ. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They want to make sure he knows which Jesus this is. Jesus, he's not the only person named Jesus. So uh, the, the one that Paul preaches, because of course the demons were listening to Paul because of the name of Jesus, right? The authority of Jesus. So they said, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They're claiming to have authority from Jesus. And verse 14, also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. They understood that it wasn't about some magic formula. It wasn't about just scaring the demons with this name. It had to do with actual authority. They had Jesus to do this, to cast out a demon. Otherwise, the demon wasn't going to listen to them, uh, no matter what they said. All right, so uh, demon possession uh, was was something that that was a sign of the kingdom it was it was a miraculous casting out demons sorry was a sign of of the kingdom and uh it was a miraculous sign just like any other miracle that was pointing to listen to the one who's doing this listen to the word of the kingdom uh because they clearly have the authority of Christ uh or the authority of God to be able to, to cast out demons. So what they're saying is from God. But now, how would you summarize what demon possession was like according to the Bible? And that's a big, that's a big question. So I'm not sure um, how, you, how you might summarize it. We're going to go through a, a few different points here and uh, try to take a, a look at, at uh, as, how I would summarize it. But I may miss some things here as well. So you can go ahead and put your uh, maybe some, some certain ideas about what it looked like uh, in the comments if you'd like to. So what did demon possession look like? First of all, I would say that it wasn't just recognized by the person who had the demon or by Jesus, but it was recognized by the people who knew them. So, you know, it, I've seen people that 
that uh, claimed to cast out demons who who would say, oh, that, that person has a demon. Oh, no, really? He, they have a demon? These people never questioned whether the, these people actually had demons. Even the, the opponents of Jesus did not question whether these people had demons. Everybody knew this person had a demon. It was recognizable. Um, and you know, it wasn't just somebody coming to Jesus saying, I think I have a demon because of this problem and that problem. No, these are, they were generally brought to Jesus by others, maybe not in every case. There was at least one case where the man was in the synagogue. Uh, but, but these people knew, everybody around them knew they had a demon. It was different from other problems. There was something different about it. We don't, we've never seen it, so we don't know exactly what the difference was, but they could recognize it. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't false accusations of demon possession. Generally, these were insults leveled at people like Jesus or John the Baptist. Uh, in John 7, verse 20, the people answered and said to Jesus, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. So Jesus said, you're trying to kill me. They said, oh no, you, he must have a demon to say something like that as kind of an insult. And then in, in chapter 8, verse 48, then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Uh, of course, he wasn't a Samaritan. He was, they knew that. That was an insult. And having a demon was considered an insult as well. But they were actually, you know, they, they actually accused him of having a demon, of being possessed by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. That's how he cast out demons. That's what they said. Uh but in, in John 10, verse 20 through 21, and many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Don't, don't listen to him. He's got a demon. Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Uh, demons never did anything miraculous. So uh, this is this was a clear sign. He, this is not someone possessed by a demon. <clears throat> you can't be possessed by a demon and do miracles. Uh, yeah, there's in modern day ideas of of demon possession. People do all kinds of supernatural things. We don't ever see that in the Bible account. They didn't do supernatural things. The closest thing to it was the the girl that told people's fortunes that. Uh, that Paul cast uh, the demon out of her because she was so annoying <laughs> and saying these people are, are preaching the, 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 the way of salvation. I, f I don't remember the exact wording, but uh, they're in, in uh, Philippi and then they were thrown into jail. Paul and Silas were thrown into jail after that because she was making a lot of money for her masters and they got mad when he cast the demon out of her. But... Um, Anyway, that's the closest thing to anything supernatural that we ever read about demons doing. And we don't even know what that means exactly that she was telling people's fortunes. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it knew the future or uh, anything, but it may be the same type of thing they do today. It may have known more about people than they would know normally about and and you can tell people all these things oh I, this is what you've done and this is what you've done and so you can trust me when i tell you this is what your future is well people have all kinds of tricks to do that and i assume demons can too uh they're expert liars aren't they but anyway we don't know of anything supernatural they certainly didn't do miracles to heal people and so they said ah you're you're accusing him falsely he can't have a demon uh, but generally, it was widely accepted when someone had a demon. There was no discussion about it. Everybody knew it. But not all problems were caused by demons, and they could tell the difference. In Luke 11, verse 14, it says, And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. As far as we know, that's all the demon did to him, <clears throat> was make him mute. He couldn't talk. And it was caused by a demon. And 
you know, that's, that's, they understood that. When the demon went out, the mute spoke and they were amazed. Well, in Mark 7, we have someone else who was mute. <clears throat> in verse 31 through 37, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Uh, immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes the de both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So here's a, a case where it's clearly not a demon causing this problem. Uh, so the very same type of problem can be caused physically or it can be caused by a demon. And the people seemed to be able to tell the difference when someone was, was uh, actually... Uh, uh, possessed by a demon as opposed to just having a physical problem. Okay, Brittany uh, says in Acts 16, verse 16 through 19, uh, it, it has the Paul casting out the spirit of divination. That's what it's called there. Um, so that's what I was referring to before. This slave girl who with a spirit of div divination Metas, who brought her master's much profit by fortune-telling. And uh, in verse 17, she was crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she kept doing it, and finally Paul was so annoyed that he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, and it did. Uh, but uh, anyway, it, it was this was something that... Uh, that uh, perhaps had some sort of supernatural uh, idea to it, the spirit of divination. Uh, but uh, I don't know for sure. But it, certainly they weren't doing miracles. Uh, we don't know of Satan or his demons knowing the future at all. It doesn't seem, to, they don't seem to have that power. Uh, they're not God. They don't have that, that same ability that God has. Uh, even the angels don't know the future, as far as we can tell. And certainly not perfectly, not in every case. A lot of things they didn't understand until it was fulfilled. So um, there's no reason to actually believe that this demon could tell the future in reality. All right. But sometimes also the demon would come and go. This is something we find in the, the case of this uh, boy that had uh, this mute spirit. And uh, when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke 9, verse 39, the father is explaining to Jesus and he says, And behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. And then in Mark 9, the same account over there, in verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And uh, I just, I find it interesting in this case that he calls it a deaf and dumb spirit, even though only... The uh, the father just called it a dumb spirit or a mute spirit, and uh, his Jesus disciples couldn't cast it out, and he said to them, "It can't. This kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting." And I have a theory that is probably ridiculous <laughs> uh, that maybe they that this is a deaf spirit somehow that the spirit itself can't hear. And that's why they couldn't cast it out, because it couldn't hear them. Uh, but Jesus has ways of communicating to these spirits. That's probably a very dumb theory, but it's just, just an idea to throw out there. All right.
It doesn't really matter one way or the other. Uh, but here, here's something that's a bit more important. Did a demon ever cause someone to sin? So this is something that uh, a lot of a lot of people's ideas about demons revolve around sin in their life. They they say, well, you know, this I'm doing this because of a demon. Um, and so, do we do we have any record of a demon ever causing someone to sin? Of course, we know if they they teach lies, they can influence people to sin. That's very clear. But in possessing someone and in the way that they, they were behaving and, and possessing people, taking over their bodies or at least parts of their bodies, uh, did they ever cause someone to sin? And this is maybe a little bit of a hard question. Uh, we, we know that there were some cases um, where um, maybe they were violent. Um, they were, there are cases where um, the fortune telling one, I suppose, I mean, that was, that was against God's law uh, to, to tell the future, uh, whether it's real or, or fake, it doesn't make any difference. That's still sinful uh, to be a fortune teller, uh, that type of thing. Uh, of course, that's mostly seen in the Old Testament, but the same ideas, the same type of of thing is talked about in the New Testament as well. Um, so those things are sinful, but d is it actually causing the person to sin? Because sin comes from within, doesn't it? And if it's just the spirit itself that's doing that with your body, you're not sinning if you're not the one doing it. I would argue that demons never have been able to cause anyone to sin. Even if they caused them to do something sinful with their bodies, it wouldn't be them doing it at all. But we don't really read about that type of thing happening. Um, we, there's the violent ones. There's the, the fortune teller. That's about as close as we get uh, to this idea. And... We don't, we don't see them doing these things in the presence of Jesus, where they're being rebellious against him. In modern day uh, ideas of, of people casting out demons today, very often the, the demons are arguing with the, the exorcist. They're saying, you'll never win. And uh, they'll, they'll say, you know, things that they may use bad language and, and blaspheme and all of this. We, you don't ever see that in the Bible. They, they did not rebel against Jesus. They were, they were afraid of Jesus. Okay. They were, they, they were begging him not to, to punish them. Okay. So that was that's a very different view than what we see in modern day. And I may have missed some things you would like to point out. If you do, you can go ahead and put those in the comments. Other things that we see in demon possession uh, in the Bible. But I'm going to make an argument that there is no more demon possession uh, today. That there there are no people being possessed by demons. And this is not something the Bible states. This is something we have to use our reasoning to come to this conclusion. Uh, and so you don't necessarily have to agree with me on this, but I would like you to follow my line of thought. All right. So uh, we don't, we don't ever find anything about demons being cast out before the time of Jesus. We don't know any cases of demon possession before the time of Jesus. Okay. So, there was a there's seems to be a point at which God allowed demons to start possessing people and that was about the same time that Jesus and his people started casting them out to demonstrate power over uh the over Satan in Matthew 
It says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. I think this is pretty clear that there were no casting, there was no casting out of demons before the time of Jesus. And so he's saying this is a sign that the kingdom has come. Uh, casting out of demons was a sign, just like all the other miracles. The other miracles have ceased uh, because the things that they are signs of have already been confirmed. There's nothing new being revealed to be confirmed by new miracles. And so there is no more casting out of demons. Um, and, uh, you know, because the word of God has already been fully delivered and confirmed by signs. So yeah, we, we get that idea from 1 Corinthians 13. In verses 8 through 13, he says, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And that doesn't mean they're not going to come to pass. That just means that it's going to stop. There's not going to be any new prophecies. They're going to fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. Uh, and so on. But... He says this is for a limited time. But if the prophecy and revealing the word of God is for a limited time, so are the signs to confirm the word. There doesn't need to be any more confirmation when they've already been confirmed. All right, so there's no more miracles if there's no more prophecy to be confirmed. And so there are, there's no more casting out of demons as well. Uh, you had to have special authority from Christ. It was a miracle to cast out a demon. If we're not confirming the word anymore because it's already confirmed, we're not given signs to do now, there's no more casting out of demons. And if there's no more casting out of demons, there's no purpose for allowing demons to possess people any longer. Okay, so uh, I don't, I don't, think there's any reason God would allow demons to continue to possess people if he doesn't give anyone the power to cast those demons out. Um, and so that that is my argument for why I don't believe there is demon possession any longer. But here's the objection that some people would make. Uh, they'd say, but I've seen it. I've seen demons being cast out of people. All right, you know, you, you go to a, a tent meeting, you watch on television uh, all these false prophets uh, claiming to cast out demons, and, you know, people have seen it. All right, well, here's what modern-day demon possession is. As far as I can understand it, there may be more things here that I've missed, but one thing is you have actors who are paid to pretend to be demon-possessed. I'm sure that's that's the case of some of these television uh, demon possession things that, you know, it's these people are claiming to really cast out demons, but nobody knows these people they're casting out demons from. They're just actors who've been brought in to pretend, like the, the Zimbabwean man who was raised from the dead. Uh, you know, he was paid to pretend to be dead. And, and the same thing is true of these demon-possessed people sometimes. I don't believe that's true all the time. There are also people who just think it's fun to pretend to have a demon. I went to a meeting, a denominational meeting in Ashawi one time, and uh, there was a, a lady there at the end of the service who started oh, crying out and wailing and oh, she's got a demon and the prophet, so-called prophet who was there, cast the demon out. And so somebody that knew her, a brother in Christ who knew her, went to talk to her the next day and said, what was that all about? And because, uh, you know, you, you're you you're crying out like that. You know, what what is that all about? She said, oh, I just thought it was fun. You know, I was just having fun. Yeah. Uh, the prophet, so-called prophet, didn't know. He, he apparently thought it was a real demon. Uh, but it wasn't. <laughs> And, uh, and so that's what sometimes what it is. It's just people who think it's fun. And sometimes it's people who want to blame their problems on a demon. I watched some episodes of 
uh, these people casting out demons and they'd, you know, the, the demon would, would talk, you know, they, they'd start sprinkling holy water on the person and, uh, yelling at them, telling them in the name of Jesus, answer me and all of this sort of thing. And, and, uh, and the, the, some, sometimes they'd lower their voice. Sometimes they wouldn't, you know, but however they thought it was supposed to look like. And, and then, you know, they, oh, you know, I've run this person's life. I've, I've done all these things, you know, to, uh, I destroyed their life. Okay. And so then afterwards they, they cast out the demon and uh, afterwards they interview them and they say, you know, what, what made you think you had a demon? Well, you know, I'm 30 years old and I just, I have nothing to show for it in my life. I, I didn't finish school, even though I'm smart. I, I had, a, I was married and, and, uh, I ruined my marriage and we were always fighting and it must be a demon, right? They want to blame their problems on a demon. And so they're, they convince themselves that they had a demon. That particular man, uh, he said, I, I came here and, and they said I had manifestations of a demon and to come back on Sunday so they could cast it out. <laughs> yeah, that, that looks a lot like what Jesus did, right? Uh, you know, oh, come, come back another time when we'll have the cameras rolling and uh, then we'll do it. Yeah. Jesus never did that. All right. And other people were, you know, oh, you know, I was so good with finances, but now I've, I've ruined uh, my, my finances and my husband's blaming me. No, it's not my fault. I have a demon. Uh, some people are saying, I, I'm too lazy to read my Bible. I want to do it, but I'm just lazy. So I must have a demon. One 10 year old girl, uh, she, she said, I, I, I have a demon that, that causes me not to listen to my parents. And, uh, you know, and she did all the acting thing that they want to see to cast out the demon. And, you know, what's your name? Lucifer. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and that's the only one she knew the name of, apparently. And, uh, which that's not even the name of a demon, but, well, could be, I don't know. Not in the Bible, it's not. Uh, and <laughs> then she, they, they bring her mother over. I say, do you recognize her? No, I don't recognize her. It's supposed to be the demon speaking. But if the demon's keeping her from obeying her mother, how does it not know her, who her mother is? I mean, there's so much just nonsense going on. These people are, 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 are faking it because they want to blame their problems on a demon or sometimes they're just having fun. But, uh, and then there's some people who don't even think they have a demon. But other people accuse them for no good reason. They just want somebody to have a demon so they can beat them and beat the demon out of them. Uh, so they just accuse them of having a demon uh, for no reason whatsoever, really. Um, and so the evidence is really against these things being anything like the demon possession we read about in the Bible. You know, people say, oh, we're undepressed. That means I have a demon. No, no. <laughs> These people in the Bible were physically controlled by the demon. They became mute. They could not talk. Uh, or they were, they were violent or, or, you know, they cut themselves not out of depression, but because of being controlled by the demon. Um, they were physically controlled. This was not them, not some demon telling, you know, changing their thoughts to, oh, you, you need to think this way. You need to think that way. You need, no, this was their body being controlled. It's very different from what people today, uh, claim, uh, their demons are like, or demon possession is like. And, uh, in, in Matthew 12, verse 22, it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. You don't find anybody like that in these so-called demon possession things today, uh, where it's actually controlling their body and oppressing them physically in that way. Um in Mark 5, we have the story of, of uh, the, the man with legion, the many demons inside of him. Uh, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could any one tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. You see the the begging <laughs> that these demons do to Jesus. Uh, you know, there's this control that they have over the body of this man. But when Jesus shows up, they're not rebelling against Jesus. They're not arguing with him. They're begging him. That's not what you see in these modern day demon possession, exorcisms, casting out of demons. Uh, Jesus didn't use holy water. He didn't have to scream at the demons to get them to come out. Uh, he was able to just tell them, come out, and they would listen to him. In Matthew 8, verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Yeah. These people are constantly screaming, come out, come out, come out, and the demons often yelling, you'll never win, you'll never win. There's nothing like that in these things. If if these people have the authority of Christ, the demons are not going to be arguing with them. You understand? Uh, they submitted to Jesus. They are afraid of Jesus. Uh, and so they did not argue with Jesus or his disciples. They just came out. That was it. All right, and uh, our last question of the day is, who is Beelzebub, or Baalzebub, or Beelzebul? Um, so these are all references to the same uh, individual, however you want to put that. But um, who is that? We've come across that name uh, today in our reading, the ruler of the demons. What, what do we know about Beelzebub? So this is, this is our bonus for today, uh, talking about demons. I just wanted uh, to end it with this because I find this very interesting. Um, but uh, Baal... We, we know the name Baal, right? From the Old Testament, one of the gods, the false gods that they worshipped in Canaan. Well, Baal means master or lord. And Zebub means flies, or maybe bees, some sort of small flying insect. So Baal Zebub means lord of the flies. And uh, this was uh, one of the gods of the Philistines, Baal Zebub. And uh, so it, in the, the Greek, in the New Testament, it actually says Baal Zebul, not Baal Zebub, but it's a reference to the same, the same thing. And so in some translations, it says Baal Zebub. Uh, at least that's my understanding of how that, that all works. But Baal Zebul means Lord of the house. Uh, and this is something that they called Baal Zebub, the, the Jews did. He was this false god. He was, uh, which remember, the idols were demons, right? Uh, and, uh, and so they, they called him the Lord of the house or the, the Lord of the demons, right? He's the head of the demons. And, uh, because they're in his house, he's the head of that house, of the house of demons. Uh, there's also a, a variation on this, Baal Zebel, <coughs> which means Lord of the Dung, <coughs> which would be attached to this idea of flies. Uh, but uh, that was apparently also something they called him. 
But in the New Testament, we have this term Beelzebul, or Lord of the house. Well, we, we find this reference to the false god in 2 Kings 1, verse 3. Uh, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you go to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron? So this is where we, we first see this name, Baal-zebub. Um, well, in, in uh, Matthew 10, verse 25, in the New King James, it says, It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? In the New American Standard, uh, it says, If they've called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they insult the members of his household? But remember, if Beelzebul means master of the house or lord of the house, you see the connection of what Jesus is saying here. If they've called the head of the house <laughs> Beelzebul, uh, which means lord of the house, but they're but which house? Beelzebul is the head of the demons, right? And so how much more will they insult the members of his household? You know, if they're saying, I'm the head of the demons and you're in my household, well, then they're basically calling you guys demons. You know, they're, they're going to insult us like this. Uh, you just get used to it. Be like your teacher. In Matthew 12, verse 24 through 29, uh, it says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Uh, and knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he has become divided against himself. And then will his kingdom stand? Uh, and so he He's referring to Beelzebul as Satan, the ruler of the demons. Um, but also he, he says down in, in, uh, in verse 29, uh, he says, Where, How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first ties up the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Well, if Beelzebul is the ruler of the demons, he's the head of the house, he's the master of the house, he's the strong man who is bound. So he's saying, I've bound Beelzebul, who is Satan. And uh, and so he is, uh, he's saying the, the one who rules the demons is Satan, they are his messengers, they are from him, and, but I've bound him. Uh, and that is the sign that the kingdom of God has come. All right. So anyway, that's that's sort of a bonus uh, thing for you to you can look at that more. You can research it on your own if you're interested. But um, but that connection between idolatry and the demons involved in idolatry and then how they talk about demons here and even demon possession and saying you're possessed by Beelzebub, Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons and Jesus is happy to use that term, it seems, but he says Satan uh, really is what we're talking about here, and he's been bound, and uh, he does not have the power that he would like to have. The kingdom of God has come. All right, that's the class for today. I don't know how helpful that was to everyone, but uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot about demons that we know, there's a lot about demons we don't know. We're just not told a whole lot of detail that we would like to know. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people know that we're interested in those things. And so they make a lot of money off of writing books or, or doing all kinds of things, saying, I have this information. I've got this all figured out. I'm a Hebrew scholar, and I've gone back, and I've, I see how these words are in the Old Testament, and and so I can tell you for sure, this is how it, no, they're just talking nonsense. Most of them don't even believe in the inspiration of the Bible. They pull in uh, ancient uh, literature from other uh, idolatrous sources saying this is how they thought about demons. No, we don't, we don't care how they thought about demons. We care what's true because demons are real and God is real 
And God is the one who can tell us about demons. Nobody else can. And so uh, it's, it's a, we don't have to, to listen to all the nonsense. We don't have to know all the answers. What we know is Christ has power over Satan. He has power over the demons. We don't have to worry about them. Mm -hmm. We just follow Christ. We understand that lies are from Satan. Uh, they're the work of, 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 the, of the demons as well, uh, trying to get us to sin against God, not through direct action of changing our thoughts, not through, through taking over our bodies either, but through lies that we have a choice to believe or reject. And, uh, and so we are just going to be faithful to Christ, and then we don't have to worry about the demons. He will take care of them. All right. Well, that's the class for today. Uh, if there's any uh, any comments on it, you can let me know. But uh, I'm not sure about next Tuesday. I'm thinking maybe we'll we'll take a look at the history of the church then. Uh, it's not. I'm not talking about biblical history so much as uh, we'll we'll see some things in the scriptures, but. We're talking about just the history that we have of how things became the way they are today. So anyway, that's what I would like to, to look at. Uh, but we'll see if, if uh, we do that next time or not. Let's go ahead and say a prayer. Our Holy Father, we're grateful that you have demonstrated through your Son, your complete power over Satan, that you are someone we can rely on, that we know there is no one uh, who can take us away from you. There is no one who can uh, force us to do anything wrong. And we're so thankful that we have that reliance uh, through your son, that we can be confident. We pray that we would live our lives faithfully never blame our sin on anyone but ourselves because we know that we truly are responsible and we know father that you would you you will judge us one day but we pray that we would be forgiven through your son we pray that we would truly repent and live our lives in a way that makes you happy we pray father that you'll be with those around us that are uh disturbed by the lies that Satan and his messengers spread. We pray that uh, you would help us to help them see your truth, because we know your truth is capable of combating these lies. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be uh, teaching the gospel and, and bringing many others to your son or to you through your son we pray father that you would be with those that are ill help them to recover soon help us to be safe as well we pray this in jesus name amen all right well thank you for joining us and uh, god bless you have a great week lord willing i'll see you on tuesday bye